Eat your lunch. Eat your lunch or you'll pass out. Did you hear me? Huh? Now what do you have there? Hmm? In your lap. That's a lunch. It's a good lunch. How do I know it's good? Guess. Take a guess. Go on. Guess. Go on. Take a guess. There you go. Go on. Take a big guess. 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 I'll give you 10 seconds to guess. Okay, I'll tell you. I know it's good because I ate just such a lunch myself, not 10 minutes before I picked you up. That's right. I found a beautiful space in the Montgomery Ward parking lot with a berm and a tree, and I got out of the car and I sat on the trunk of the car and I ate my lunch in the shade of the tree with my feet on the berm. That was a good lunch. And a good experience overall, which filled me with good positive feelings of bonhomie <laughs> and a hopeful outlook on the continued success of the species. A girl like you needs to eat. A growing girl? Whew. If you don't eat, you'll die. That's one of the facts of life. I know because I'm alive. You can't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an expert on being alive. <laughs> Getting better and better at it every day. I'm bursting with life. It's uh, like being on fire, except you still appreciate the small things like newspapers and birds. Well, enough about me. <laughs> My seat is strong. Comes out like cottage cheese and sits heavy in the hand. It's warm and Stays warm a long time. <laughs> I call it liquid smoke. My doctor hates that. Makes him throw up a little. But he has to examine me anyway. Because of doctor law. <laughs> How do I know my seat is strong? I've impregnated more women than I've even met. Most kids are my kids. In some cultures, I would be considered a king. <laughs> well, what do you think of your lunch, huh? I think it's darn good. I made it at the same time as my lunch, and it's based on my lunch. The way a poem is based on a feeling. It's a sort of reflection on the importance of my lunch. I think you would enjoy it. Why don't you eat it? Okay, why don't you tell me who your favorite actor is, and I'll tell you if people say I look like him. Don't act up. There's a pack of cigarettes in the glove compartment. Why don't you fetch me one? You want one? You smoke? I once saw a boy smoke 10 cigarettes at the same time. <laughs> this was at the circus, obviously. He had them bunched up in his mouth like a magazine of bullets, taking quick, dry, grimacing puffs. Dirty as hell, standing in the mud wearing nothing but a diaper with a little hat in front of him for donations. <laughs> he wasn't getting donations, but he didn't seem bothered, exactly. He squinted into the distance with a look that made you think he resented just being able to see. His skin was sooty, like somebody would rolled him in gunpowder. You felt bad for him. The way you feel bad for a dog you have to shoot. You ever have to shoot a dog? Awful. 
My least favorite thing to do to a dog, <laughs> besides ride him or fight him for food, but this cigarette kit. <laughs> I remember his little toe was deformed, sticking out crooked from the rest of him, beating back and forth in the air like an exposed heart. <laughs> you know what? The memory of this boy is as vivid as a picture to me. Isn't that strange? I can see him now, right before my eyes. Like he's standing up inside my brain. Why do you suppose I remember him so vividly? Hmm? Wanna guess? <laughs> well, I'm ashamed to say it's because I stole this boy's hat and pushed him into the mud and peed on him and called him a Nazi <laughs> and spit my taffy down his throat and made him chew it and swallow it again when he coughed it up. That is one of the biggest regrets of my life. <laughs> Deep down, I think I was jealous of his prowess when it came to smoking in volume. And jealous of his personal sovereignty. Traveling from town to town with the circus, dirty and half naked. <laughs> a way of life which I considered to be a huge plus on all fronts. Here's some free advice. Huh? Don't ever steal. And don't speak with your fists, and don't speak with your spit, and don't call someone a Nazi, unless you can prove it. Like with a picture of Hitler buying him dinner, and the dinner's one long strand of spaghetti that makes him kiss when they eat it. <laughs> Wanna know why? I'll tell you. Guess. Let me tell you. I've regretted that day from that day forward ever since for the rest of my life because it turned out that boy wasn't a stranger but a blood relation the moment i got a good look at him cowering in the dirt i knew it was my cousin toots the son of my mom's brother fancy gary the crawdad man and the second i realized this all the other dominoes started to fall down one by one like dominoes <laughs> He wasn't with the circus, but just at the circus, like I was. And he wasn't performing for donations, but begging for money. And he wasn't a Nazi, but a regular German-American in a diaper. Like me, but in a diaper. Like me, but in a different diaper. <laughs> One that wasn't just for show. <laughs> I wore a diaper because my mom wanted people to see we could afford them. <laughs> They left strangle marks on my hips and thighs and made me walk wrong like I was running underwater, but I felt like a prince inside them, peeing freely and laughing and laughing. <laughs> because they were so floridly unnecessary. <laughs> At my size, they were clearly a luxury item. <laughs> I knew Toots wore a diaper because bad diet puckered him up inside, and he leaked. <laughs> he wasn't born with the silver spoon and that darn good lunch in your lap in his mouth. <laughs> and when my mom found out what I did, whoo, she made me walk all the way down to his house by the creek on Christmas and bring him a plate of rolls and ham and give him one of my good hats and some quality candy to cancel the taffy I'd spit into him, and a jug of clean water to make up for the pee, and she made me shake his hand and tell him I loved him, even though he was strange and quiet and leaked, because he was family. And the familial bond is made of the strongest material there is, which is blood. And that was the worst Christmas I ever had. <laughs> and I still write about it in my diary. And when I do, I write so hard the pen rips through the paper. And I don't call it Christmas anymore. I call it my anniversary of being wronged. <laughs> Maybe if I had a better moral compass and a firmer sense of personal sovereignty back then, maybe 
I could think of toots without becoming enraged. <laughs> well, enough about me. <laughs> I call my diary the almanac of degenerate urges. I carved a skull shape in the front with a razor. The skull shape signifies skulls, and the skulls signify degenerate urges. And the razor signifies ingenuity because I stole it from a sleeping policeman. <laughs> anyway, every night I tear the pages out of my diary and burn them and start fresh from the beginning. So it's never finished. I've never even made it past my own childhood, and I guess you could call it my only hobby. Sometimes, when it's quiet, I can feel the terrible capacity for violence inside me. Like a, another person living inside me. Wanting the same things as me, but getting them the wrong way. You are the woman that I've always dreamed of. I knew it from the start. <laughs> You can listen to the radio once we've had a true, touching experience that bonds us as a family. Here, put this back. I don't even smoke, to be honest. I just wanted to impress you. I was real excited to meet you. When I got the letter from your grandma, I practically had a heart attack. I stood up at Rosie's where I was eating my eggs and reading the bra ads in the paper, and I said, Gentlemen, you are in the midst of a man in the throes of a practical heart attack in front of you because my own daughter, I didn't know existed, does! <laughs> I was smiling so hard I felt like I was being electrocuted. <laughs> With the letter rolled tight in my hand, What do you think, boys? I said. The boys called me a queer and made me get down from the table. <laughs> <coughs> That's how we joke around. Calling each other a queer and getting called a queer in return. Telling each other to sit back down when we're standing up. <laughs> uh, makes us laugh nonstop. <laughs> Because it's comedy gold. We recognize that the funniest thing about being a queer is not being one. <laughs> Except this time, all of a sudden, I wasn't laughing nonstop. I was picturing you in my mind due to the fact you existed, which I learned from your grandma. <laughs> Rosie's is a diner I bet you'd love. <laughs> because it has free newspapers and a real cigarette machine and breakfast as an anytime option. <laughs> and a picture of Farrah Fawcett in the men's room where someone drew her nipples in with a red pen so you can really see them. <laughs> but we both don't smoke, it turns out. And you won't even eat lunch as an anytime option. And only I can use the men's room because I'm a man. And I've seen the nipple so many times, it's, it's like breathing to me. I'm not even aware I'm doing it, even though it's keeping me alive.
Anyway, I get my mail at Rosie's because if I'm not at Rosie's, I'm on the road. <laughs> I was happy your grandma didn't send me a picture of you because it made me think of you all different ways. It was like there was more of you. I pictured you looking every possible way and feeling every possible way about me. Having these ideas of you... <coughs> felt, felt better than having money. Why don't you take a bite of your lunch? Huh? <coughs> oh! Okay, <laughs> you don't like it. That that's fine. That's that's okay. <laughs> it's it's not for everyone that lunch. That's fine. That's okay. It's it's good just just hanging out. <laughs> you don't have to eat it. It's... Hey, guess what? You're acting like my doctor when I tell him about my liquid smoke. <laughs> it's funny if you know my doctor. <laughs> I lied before about having lots of kids. It was a lie slash joke. I said lie because it wasn't funny. If it was funny, <coughs> I'd call it a joke. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was real excited to meet you. I, I wanted to impress you. I, I lied. I lied. Most kids aren't my kids. Only you are. Okay. Huh? Is Elliot Gould your favorite actor? <laughs> because that's who people say I look like. <laughs> but I don't think so. Anyway, it's a shame because Elliot Gould isn't anyone's favorite actor. <laughs> uh, I wanted to impress you. I, I don't know. Maybe I was wrong. I thought it was good. I was... Real excited to meet you. It... It means a lot to see you. I wish I could have seen you earlier. I, I feel terrible about it.
kid threw a rock at my sister and her head busted open. We were hunting pill bugs in front of my grandma's house, which was my house because I lived there. Pulling back the stones from the oak tree and spreading the dirt with our hands. This took two people and brooked no malingerers because it required the focused effort of both parties at all times. One to hold up the rock and one to run her hand over the dirt gently like smoothing linen. When we found one, we'd pick it up and make a curl. Then we'd set it back on the ground and wait for it to open up. <clears throat> Sometimes this weight was unbearable. You'd watch and watch and never get its trust back. Then you'd tap its shell to force it, but it stayed a hard ball, hard and evil. And then, if you were me, and your emotions drove you around your own life in a hazy, breathless frenzy, you'd kick a hole in the dirt and bury the damn thing alive. Only this day, we found a nest of dead white ones who had died on their own. Look there, Harriet. I told my sister Harriet. It's your pearls. She didn't get it. Because she didn't know what pearls were. Or why it was funny they'd be under a rock. Or why they were better to have than dead bugs. Harriet wasn't stupid. She lacked experience with the things of this world. But I'd seen pearls on TV, so I got it. I knew they were British necklaces, and you got to clutch them if someone was murdered. <laughs> I liked getting it about the pearls when Harriet didn't. It felt as good as having money. So this kid came up with a stick and started tapping the edge of the grass where it was ours, acting uninterested, but spying us when our heads were down. I couldn't see him with my head down, but I knew he was spying. I could feel it. Like you can feel yourself about to need to pee before you need to pee. Hey kid, stop spying, I said. But he acted dumb, tapping his stick along our lawn and a little on the neighbor's lawn for cover. Hey kid, get out of here. You're making me crazy with that stick. That got him looking up at me. He smiled. The kid had tight, panicky features that made it look like someone was sucking his head from inside. He wore a man's dress shirt, buttoned to the top, white, but filthy on the neck and cuffs. He looked like a magician who'd done 10 years hard labor. Harriet, this kid is definitively making me crazy. I looked at Harriet and back at the kid. He kept smiling. He made the international crazy signal by rotating his finger around his temple. This kid thought he was pure comedian. He didn't know he was clearly an idiot. I guess I couldn't blame him for not knowing because not knowing he was an idiot was what made him an idiot in the first place. But there was another thing. In making the crazy signal, he shifted his stick from one hand to the other, and I saw his last three fingers were clubby, like his hand was part baby. I almost dropped my rock on my sister when I saw. The run fingers were fully formed, but bruise red, the color of blackberry jam, and so swollen and small they, they wouldn't bend. These fingers made me sick with fascination. Suddenly this kid had something I was interested in, and I saw him in an entirely new light. It was as if someone had picked him up and put him in a shop window in my head. All of a sudden he was the latest thing. I looked at my own hands, whose outline parts were red from holding the rock. On my right wrist was a snap bracelet with a picture of a cartoon dog giving me a thumbs up, which I got at school for reading five books in a whole year. This was so easy to do, it wasn't even worth goddamn mentioning. Even Chubbs Although Ogletree could read five books in a whole year, and he had a bad brain from when he cliff-jumped into the trench and landed on his neck. 
And now he couldn't even peel an orange on his own and had to spend his whole after school sitting on the curb naming birds. The classy thing to do would have been to refuse the prize on principle, but I wanted the bracelet, so I didn't refuse. And I was glad I had it, even though it was unearned. I didn't mind having things I never deserved before. It didn't change the good feeling of having them. And it made them more valuable to people who didn't. I fixed my eyes on the kid with the stick. Hey kid, come here. What, he said. Come on over here. He chewed on it for a second. He looked up in the sky like he was waiting for his mom or someone to bend out of the clouds and tell him what to do. I don't think so, he said. But he stayed where he was standing, his dumb smile feeling its way carefully onto his face, like a mouse creeping into a loud room. How come I ain't seen you before, I said. I don't know, he said. Maybe you just never did. Well, where do you live? He pointed behind him, meaning any goddamn where. What are you doing, I asked. Just walking, I guess. Come here. Uh-uh. Are you alone? Yeah. Just walking alone by yourself? Yeah. No parents? Uh-uh. He smiled a little more. Come on over here a second. No, I don't think I will. Well, where are your parents at? Now he smiled huge. At the hospital? The hospital? Yeah. He looked like he was laughing at a great joke only he could hear. He breathed funny. Something curious was revving inside him. Are they sick? Uh-uh. Is one of them sick and the other is there out of love? Uh-uh. Then why are they at the hospital? They went with my grandma, he almost screamed. They had to drive my grandma out of the hospital if she fell out of bed, hollering names of people I never heard of and screaming like she's covered in fire. And now half her face is bugged out and the other half won't work at all. And when she talks, it comes out underwater, even though it's in the air. The kid slapped his knee with his unremarkable hand. You could tell he cherished this story, the way I cherished getting into about the dead bug pearls. He thought maybe his whole performance with the stick was just a way to get someone to ask him what he was doing so he could tell this story. If that was true, then I was a sucker. And I hated myself. And I hated this kid even more than I hated the devil even. At least the devil didn't have a goddamn grandma. She peed the bed too, he said, bubbling his mouth. I found it after they took her. They didn't say anything about it, but I found it, the pee. I got inside her bed and felt it. It was cold, like being touched on your back by a ghost. Now he got so excited he dropped his stick. He floated onto the lawn. It reminded me of cartoons, when the skunk falls in love. I wanted to stop him so bad I almost dropped my rock again. He leaned down to Harriet, listening with her hands in the dirt. He smiled. Isn't that a story, he asked her. He leaned down like he was listening to something she hadn't said, and by listening, he contrived to get her to say it. He reached forward and touched her hair. Hey, kid, what the hell's wrong with your hand, I said. Nothing, he said, hiding it, because he knew exactly what I was talking about. I saw it. Nothing. The word sounded smaller when he said it again, as if it had less letters. I saw it. What's wrong with your fingers? Nothing. Fine. I don't even want to know. But now you better get off my property, you idiot kid. And if I never see you again, it'll be too soon. And quit smiling at my sister and I bet your grandma's dead. He looked at me as if I'd run over his hand myself. When he got to the edge of the lawn, he just stood there, kind of hunched, as if he were waiting for someone to drape a coat over him. And he spun around. There's nothing wrong with it, he said, his voice so small it was practically thinking. It's just a birth defect. 
There's millions of kinds of birth defects. I've seen hundreds of different kinds of them. You just don't know about things. You think you do, but you don't. There's nothing wrong with it, and it don't matter. Then he leaned down to the ground with the normal boy hand and grabbed a rock and, and threw it at my sister. He missed. But I was so shocked, I dropped my rock, the one I was holding. That's why I mentioned it earlier. That's what all the mentioning was leading up to. That's good storytelling. <laughs> the rock landed on Harriet's body, sort of pinning her. It wasn't too bad, but... But now she was in shock too and didn't wriggle out when she should have because the kid leaned down with his monster hand and grabbed another rock and threw it at my sister's head. This one struck. It made a sound like punched wet dough. Harriet fell over backwards and her eyes rolled straight up as if she were looking through the top of her head at my grandma's house, which was her house because she lived there. Ah, oh, jeez, the kid said. Ah, oh, jeez, ah, oh, jeez, ah, oh, jeez, ah, oh, jeez. He approached us real shy and sweet all of a sudden, careful not to quite look at her until he was ready. But she was his own baby and had come to the hospital to visit her for the first time. I pushed him over and I spit on him. I kicked him in the stomach. Don't look at my sister, you goddamn kid! Harriet was on the ground next to the rock that hit her. And I could see my sister's brains on it, the rock. They were wadded like pink Kleenex. I look back at Harriet. She was lying right on top of the pearls, still pinned by the rock I dropped, but, but just at the feet. It didn't look too bad at the feet. It looked like she could wriggle away in a minute when she was ready. I stood and looked and waited. She wasn't moving much. Then a sound came out of her that was all longing. Then she was dead. Like the dead people on TV. Who, if you look at them close enough, you could tell they weren't. Even though you could tell by looking at her for a second she was, because there wasn't anything real left inside her. She looked like a Halloween mask after you took it off and threw it in the corner. She's fake now. I turned back to the kid. He was still on the ground where I pushed him. And kicked him again. He wasn't even crying. He seemed too scared to breathe. I kicked him again. He lay still and quiet, faking it. His eyes were crushed tight shut. I could tell he was faking it. I could see his chest pumping fast, like a dog that's run itself out. So I kicked him in the face. And I kicked him again in the face. And I kicked him again in the face until his eye was squished on the toe of my shoe and he made a low, wet, breathing moan like he was breathing corn syrup. You can't fake that. I did this bad thing and... I don't feel bad about it. I do bad things all the time. I liked you better when you were mean to me. Who are you? I know who you are, but you tell me who. I know my grandma didn't want me. I know you didn't either. I can hear you both talking. I can listen through walls. 
isn't a superpower, but it feels like one. I can tell what people really think of me. I know my grandma paid you to take me. I saw her pass you the check and say, this much now, this much every month. You think I'm stupid, I'm not. Harriet wasn't dead. She wasn't even faking it. I just told you she was dead to make the bad things seem less bad. But now I know I can tell you things because you're bad too. I know together we can share how bad it is. I want to tell you. You think I'm stupid, but I'm already learning from you. You tell me who you are with your own mouth, and I'll tell you who I am. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Listen. Listen. 